Thank you. I want to start by saying thank you to all of you and to Time magazine. But I also want to start by thanking my family because without them, and I'm sure it's true for all of you here, without our families who support us, and particularly me and my determination that we set out now what we humans want to do with our lives with AI, then we wouldn't have the time or space to have these conversations. What I said on the um, film was that I don't want us to wake up in 2050 and find that we wished we had had conversations today about artificial intelligence and how we human beings interact with it for our future. I genuinely believe that we have a great future with AI and it's in our hands to shape it now. We need to do that now. My story in Responsible AI would not have started without good journalism. And good journalism is something we need to protect now. Because we see deep fakes, problems with elections, and journalism is under threat from AI. But also it has great potential where AI is used wisely in journalism. Back in 2011, I picked up a Time magazine edition, which featured a cover story entitled 2045, the year man, I'll come back to that word man, becomes immortal. At the time, I was writing a book about human rights, and I was immediately fascinated by the idea of how we as humans would live and work with powerful computers. In fact, I was so enthralled that I devoted the final chapter of my book to pondering what I thought would be those complex issues of interactions between humanity and machines. I was on my path that led me here and hopefully beyond. Put simply, we need to work out now if humans want to fly the plane, as they do in Star Wars or Star Trek, or whether we want to hand it over to AI. It's a simple analogy for our current and future interactions and a decision we need to make now. And that brings me with planes to another story. Our daughter is a pilot in the US Air Force. There are about 6.5% of pilots in the Air Force who are women, and only 3% of them fly fighters. You remember that Time article I referenced, the year man becomes immortal. This brings me to a point about data, the oxygen of AI. Our daughter's data as a female military pilot is overwhelmed by that of her male colleagues. Whether it comes to flying, or perhaps more importantly, to her health care in the event of an injury. If we are to succeed in creating better economic prospects for all with AI, we have to start by doing better with data. About three billion people cannot access the internet. Put that against the 180 million or so who use ChatGPT monthly. Billions more have not created a sufficiently large data footprint for their contributions to be evaluated by generative AI without very precise prompts. Indeed, the bulk of the data on heart attacks comes from white American men over 55. I guess it's probably no surprise to you that the majority of data comes from white men. 
mainly based in the global north. It's just that they've had the pen for longest in the data that we are using to train our generative AI. It seems sometimes that we haven't come very far. Jane Austen wrote her novel Persuasion in 1817. Her heroine said, I'm not going to refer to books to back up my argument about women's feelings because they've all been written by men. I hear you saying, well, that's just the way the world is. And I agree, that's true. But one of the power and potential and also the peril of AI is that we can now go beyond how it is to collect and use data of how we mean it to be. We have far to go, but I think in the last year we've seen some great things in terms of organizations putting in place good foundations for responsible design, development, and use of artificial intelligence before they go ahead with AI solutions. I have hope that we can truly come together to make AI a safe and equitable tool that we use to advance humanity as well as our economy for everyone. So, I ask you that we plan together our future and we start doing so today. Thank you.